We are proud of QQ's distinguished record of innovative teaching and scientific research. From nanotechnology to environmental engineering, join us and become a scientific pioneer at Our first experiment is Franz Reichelt's aviator suit. If there's anything to be said for Franz Reichelt, the French tailor, inventor, and parachuting pioneer, it's that he had extreme faith in himself, or I mean, he was just cocky. In the early 1900s, Franz crafted a parachute from 320 square feet of fabric, all of which folded up into a wearable aviator suit. He had conducted several parachute tests using dummies, which all failed. He Keeping the blame on the building, saying they simply weren't tall enough. Yeah, that is a red flag. So in 1912, Franz planned to test his latest version by fleeing a dummy from the Eiffel Tower. But when he arrived at the famous landmark, the inventor surprised the waiting crowd by strapping on the parachute suit himself and taking the leap. Again, not the best idea. The parachute didn't open, however, and Franz became a victim of his own invention. Now an autopsy reportedly determined that he died of a heart attack on the way down. Down, but regardless, it was a very stupid idea for him to do, and I am super shocked by this. Next up is the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. Researchers at the University of Minnesota experimented on consensuous objectors during World War II between November 19th, 1944 and December 20th, 1945. Now, the investigation was designed to determine the psychological effects of severe and prolonged dietary restriction and the effectiveness of dietary rehabilitation strategies. The study was divided into four phases, a 12-week baseline control phase, a 24-week starvation phase, causing each participant to lose an average of 25% of his pre-starvation body weight, and two recovery phases in which various rehabilitative diets were tried. The first rehabilitative stage was restricted by eating 2,000 to 3,000 calories a day, and the second phase was unrestricted, letting the subjects eat as much food as they wanted. Now, the Rehab phase proved to be psychologically the hardest part for most of the men. Now, although the men claimed the effects were worth it for their contributions to science, some continued to binge eat and experience crippling depression after the study concluded. Now, another effect of the study included self mutilation, where one subject, Sam Legg, amputated three fingers on his hand with an axe, though he was unsure if he had done it intentionally or accidentally. Moving on to Steuben Firth's yellow fever experiment. Steuben Firth was a medical student who believed that yellow fever wasn't contagious. To prove it, he tried some awful experiments on himself at the turn of the 19th century. But I mean, hey, at least he did it to himself and not to others. Stubbins cooked vomit from yellow fever patients on a stove and breathed in the vapors. He dropped the vomit into his eye, into an incision he had made on his left arm, and put drops of a patient's blood serum into his left leg. Now, eventually, he was basically drinking shots of black vomit straight. Yeah, if you're gagging at that thought, I am too. Trust me. <laughs> now, how did he manage to ingest all of this without falling ill? Well, we now know that yellow fever is spread by mosquitoes. Now, is this just a disgusting experiment gone right? Well, not exactly. We also know now that yellow fever can be spread from human to human through direct bloodstream contact, and Stebbins was deliberately introducing samples into his bloodstream. So, how'd he avoid contacting the virus? It's been proposed that he may have had immunity from an unrecorded bout of yellow fever earlier in life, or maybe he just got extremely lucky and the samples he used were virus free. Either way, people should not be drinking other people's vomit. Now let's discuss Biosphere 2. In the early 90s, eight scientists sealed themselves into a 3.14 acre structure in Arizona. The highly publicized $200 million experiment was known as Biosphere 2, and according to one of the scientists involved, its goals included education, eco-technology development, and learning how well our eco-laboratory worked. But the scientists ran into a number of problems that required outside interference 
in order to continue the experiment, including a lack of sunlight that affected crops, a cockroach infestation, an injured crew member who had to temporarily leave for treatment, and insufficient oxygen. This ruined the validity of the test for a lot of people. Now, people also noticed that they dishonestly used a CO2 scrubber. Now, most of the participants, as it turned out, had a little academic training. Now, eventually, it lost all credibility and was even put on a list of the 100 worst experiments of the century. Now, this was seen as a failure, but similar experiments have been recently conducted to see if we can sustain human life on Mars. Coming up next is TGN-1412. Leukemia is a horrible disease, so of course medications that could potentially treat the condition are of high priority. However, because of the nature of cancer drugs, they need to go through several trials before they are used on humans. Now, the disastrous elephant man drug trial, though, caused shockwaves in the medical and pharmaceutical community. Unfortunately, the experimental drug TGN-1412 was moved to human trials far too early, and eight young men volunteered to be test subjects for the medication. Within an hour of receiving the drug, six of the volunteers' bodies fell into cytokine storms, causing organ failure, soaring fevers, and unbearable swelling. The patients were hospitalized for weeks afterwards, some even losing body parts due to dry gangrene. It was later established that the TGN-1412 dose has caused an extreme and near-fatal immune response. The participants were hospitalized for periods of three to six weeks, and the long-term effects on their immune system remains unknown, though on discharge, some were warned that they may suffer an increased risk of cancers and autoimmune diseases. Now let's talk about the elephant rampage. Conducted by Dr. Lewis Jolly and Jolly West and two colleagues, this experiment took place in 1962 at the University of Oklahoma. West's stated intention was to see whether LSD, yet to hit the streets as a recreational drug, would induce a condition called Musk and Tusco, a three-time bull Asian elephant. Tusco, the prize of Oklahoma City Zoo, was injected with 279 milligrams of LSD, an enormous dose even for an elephant, and more than 30 times what a three-ton human might receive. After five minutes, Tusco trumpeted, fell over, defecated, and began shuddering violently. His pupils dilated, his legs became stiff, he bit his tongue, and his breathing became labored. 20 minutes later, in an attempt to calm him, a large, again almost certainly too large, amount of the antipsychotic thrazine was injected into the elephant, probably inducing a massive drop in blood pressure and heart palpitations. Now, it didn't help, and after another hour, West pumped Tusco with a tranquilizer, and a few minutes later, he was dead. The whole process took one hour and 40 minutes, and a great deal of controversy surrounds the Tusco experiment. Rumors persist that West was on LSD during the experiment and the following autopsy, and that he shot Tusco up with amphetamines. Moving on to Mengele's twins. During World War II, the Germans decided they would carry out some of the most horrific human experiments imaginable. Dr. Joseph Mengele made a full use of the tens of thousands of prisoners available to him. He would carry out unnecessarily cruel and unusual experiments, often with little or no scientific merit. And above all, he was fascinated with identical twins. Initially, his chosen twins were provided with relatively comfortable accommodations, as well as more generous rations than the rest of the inmate population. However, this was just temporary. He would then do things like amputate one twin's limb and then compare the growth of both over the following days, or he would infect one twin with a disease like typhoid. When they died, he would then end the life of the healthy twin too and then compare their bodies. Records show that one night this doctor injected chloroform directly into the heart of 14 sets of twins. Now all died almost immediately. Another infamous story story tells of Mengali trying to create his own conjoined twins as he simply stitched two young Romani boys back to back. Now they both died of grand green after several long and painful days, and nobody will ever know just how many people were victims of Mengele's experiments, but what he did was truly disturbing. Next up is the UCLA schizophrenia medication experiment. In 1983, researchers at UCLA began studying 50 patients suffering from schizophrenia. The aim to figure out if the symptoms of the disorder, such as lack of concentration, delusions, and hallucinations, would improve by taking patients off their medications. Now, this just doesn't make sense or sound like a good idea to me, but okay. Now, researchers in the study, the UCLA Schizophrenic Disorders Research Project, said they were trying to find out 
if some schizophrenics might do better without medication. Now, all the patients signed informed consent documents stating that they understood that in the experiment, their conditions might improve, worsen, or remain unchanged. But they were not told how severe their relapses might be, including the possibility of suffering increasingly severe symptoms with each recurrence. Families of two of the patients filed complaints about the experiment with the federal government. One of the patients, Antonio Lamardred, a former UCLA student, ended his own life. The other, Gregory Aller, dropped out of college and threatened to end the life of his parents. In its final report, the Office on Research Risks at the National Institute of Health said the experiment failed to comply with the requirements of HHS regulations by not telling patients the extent of the risk they would be asked to take and not telling them that ordinary treatment would be safer for most of them. Critics pointed to a serious breach of ethics when the researchers failed to warn the subjects of how worse their symptoms might get, and it's crucial for investigators to consider the way we treat our participants, says historian of psychology Kathy Fay, PhD. Now let's talk about the coffee experiment. When coffee first came to Sweden, it was treated like a dangerous poison that was sure to shorten your lifespan. But I mean, I think some people still feel that way today. Now in the 18th century, laws and taxes were set up to curb abuse of both coffee and tea. Eventually coffee was banned outright, and King Gustav III strongly believed that coffee could end people's lives, so he set up an experiment. He pardoned two prisoners convicted of homicide, awaiting the death sentence on two conditions. First, they would stay in prison for life. Second, they would drink three pots of coffee every day, and the other would drink three pots of tea. Gustav wanted to prove that their lifespans would plummet, but he proved the opposite instead. The tea drinker died first at age 83, and there is no record of when the coffee drinker died, except that he outlived both the tea drinker and Gustav III himself. And last on our list is the cat telephone. Yes, you unfortunately heard that right. A cat telephone has been created in history. Two scientists, Ernest Glenn Weaver and Charles W. Bray, conducted an experiment to turn a cat into a telephone in 1929. They first extracted a piece of the cat's skull, then placed an electrode on the animal's hearing nerves. These electrodes were connected to an amplifier with cables 59 feet long. Thus, a sound coming to the ear of the cat would be be heard in the room where the amplifier was located. Now the result was successful. Speech was transmitted with great fidelity. Simple commands, counting, and the like were easily received. Indeed, under good conditions, the system was employed as a means of communication between operating and soundproof, they wrote. Now then they decided to end the life of the cat and try it again but it didn't work. Now that's how science learned dead cats can't be telephones, but live ones can. Well, that's all for our list of the top 10 disturbing scientific experiments gone wrong. Which experiment do you think is the worst? Let us know in the comments down below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. I'm your host, Emily, and we'll see you next time. Peace.